Now then, you're welcome along to the Huddle Breakdown, the podcast that looks at the stats, XG and performance of Celtic FC. Two games to get our teeth into this week and thankfully it was two wins. A 2-1 victory over Motherwell and a 4-0 win away to St. Mirren on Wednesday night. Juco James and Alan Morrison are with me as always. Guys, hello. Hello. Hey guys. We're coming at you a little bit later than usual, but no harm, no foul. We are getting our teeth into two wins, thankfully. Uh, the Motherwell game, Stephen Welsh got his first goal, Odson Edward on the score sheet, then St Mirren, Tom Rogic, Edward, Christie and Turnbull with the goals. So let's start with the Motherwell win then, Alan. I think you're taking this one this week, are you? Yeah, sure. No, it was uh, reasonably solid, I think. Uh, what what struck me as surprising was, because I think Motherwell had gone on quite a good run since is it Graham Alexander took over from uh, Robinson. I think they'd only lost one in maybe six, and apologies if I've not got that right. So I was expecting a much kind of harder game, I suppose. What what really shocked me actually was that Alexander set up the team almost identically to how Robinson had set them up when we beat them four uh, one for a park with a with a quite a rigid actually four three three formation, leaving three players very high, but but also the whole team quite narrow. Uh, and and that, that that you know that win I think was one of Celtic's again seen as a great performance, but really I would more attribute it to the slightly naive setup of the opposition in terms of how easy it was to play against and how little uh, trouble they really gave uh, Celtic, and that was certainly true for most of most of this game, especially when Celtic can scored early, a couple of minutes in. Um, but actually after that, you know, despite how you know the, the fact that Celtic were able to progress the ball. Um, very easily. I'll come to that in a second. Celtic kind of meandered through that first half, pretty pretty happy to control possession. But by half time, we'd got about 0.8 of an X, XG by half time, and there was actually we'd had no shots at all between the 21st and the 40th minute. It just seemed to we'd sort of slipped into a kind of passive mode, having got that that lead. Willie McStay was commentating on Celtic TV. And he actually made a quite a, an interesting I, a comment I picked up on. Quite interesting, I think he said um, there's a lot of repetitive moves, and, and that's absolutely right because the fullbacks were always free in this formation, and 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 and, and they, the fullbacks received an astonishing 55 pack passes between them, i.e., the, 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 either the centre backs or, or or usually Scott Brown was able to find them and take out that front three. Um, with a single pass, um, 55 times. Now, actually, 38 of those times, it, the, 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 that one pass took out the, the, you know, Cole and um, Watt and Long that were their, their sort of front three. And, and the reason I say it's kind of naive is because the problem with that is once you've made that pass, that means you're essentially accepting the fact that the fullbacks are now pushed on or Brown might have been pushed on. You're essentially playing 7v7 in your own half. Now, that's quite a lot of space to control with very few players. And that's why I think it's a really uh, problematic way to play, a really problematic uh, way to um, to set up. The other thing that surprised me about how Motherwell played was that given that they had three fairly physical players up front, they never, they very rarely actually launched long balls in, in their direction to try and catch Celtic on the counter. Given the fact that both Celtic fullbacks were given licence to bomb on, you know that ball was always on in, in, into the corner, and it, it virtually never happened. So I just was really stunned by the way that uh, the way that Motherwell played. Credit to Celtic, I do have to say, is that when they came out in the second half, really kind of um, racked up the chances. Uh, so between the half time and the 60th um, and the 60th minute, which is when nearly when you know Motherwell started to score, we really racked up nearly another extra one one x you know xg in that period. Quite a few good chances. Obviously, the, sec- the second goal arrived quite early, and it looked it looked to be honest like a pretty routine win uh, at that point. And then obviously you know Motherwell scored. I think around the 66th, 67th minute, um, which was a bit of an odd goal. Um, you know, Brown as the six should have been closing Campbell down. He was allowed to run forever, and then as he hit this really fluky shot that kind of looped up over over Bain. But where 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 I think there's a then I want to sort of touch on is Lennon in his pre-match uh, against St Mirren made I think quite an interesting comment. He said when you know, he was asked were you were you were you um happy with the way the team had played against uh, Motherwell and he said yeah I was happy for the first 70 minutes and I, and I was and having watched the game back 
you know, again, you got the impression that, oh, well, if Celtic could control the game, it would have been easy. Then Motherwell scored this kind of goal from nothing. And then suddenly it was all hands to the pump. And it really wasn't. You know, after Motherwell scored, they had a bit of a flurry of activity where they suddenly played at a slightly higher tempo and they went a bit more direct. But that sort of, you know, that sort of momentum didn't actually last for very long. It petered out pretty quickly. And then nothing much happened until the last two minutes of injury time when a bunch of long high balls went into the box and there was like chaos and carnage in, in Celtic's penalty area. And, and I just think that comment was really... And the reason he mentioned 70, 70 minutes, not 66, which is when Motherwell scored, is because that's when he took Scott Brown off. And I think it was almost a pretty childish comment at the sort of uh, the Brown critics to say, oh, I took Scott Brown off like you all wanted me to do after 70 minutes. And the game fell to pieces at that point. Uh, no, it didn't, actually. <laughs> you know, it really it really didn't. It kind of nearly fell apart in the last two minutes when they had, you know, a number of uh, a corners, long throws and long balls into the box that, as I say, you know, caught Celtic uh, for, for various reasons. But it wasn't because he took Brown off after 70 minutes. And I think that just, to me, that, you know, we'll probably come on to that again. It just kind of sets up the, the narrative of probably Brown, you know, um, going to be playing now for the rest the rest of the season. But uh, that will maybe leave that one for another time. So I think if you look at this game, you know, the, the really the, the thing the thing that again I was a bit cross about Lennon was was on the substitutions because I'm thinking if you really want to close a game out when you're two one up and you're feeling like the other team are coming into it a bit, the last thing I would do is bring on El Yunusi, Griffiths, keep Roger on, and by the way, let's introduce Laxo. I mean, four more randomly chaotic players I couldn't he could it's hard to imagine if you really want to control a game those are not the players that you really uh, want on the pitch a midfield of, of El Yunusi and Rogic isn't going to exert defensive solidity and control you mm. know Laxalt when he cleared the ball off the line in the last minute was marking Cole in the centre half position when the ball came across and that's the only reason he was then able to clear the ball off the line. He'd already given the ball away twice in attacking situations. Once when he got the ball wide left and he just sort of meandered, <laughs> didn't, didn't look for a teammate, didn't cut back, play the easy ball back, start again. He just kind of lost possession, which is kind of what he does. So the, so, uh, the substitutions didn't help, but, but, the, but the narrative that Celtic fell apart after 70 minutes, to be honest, just wasn't, wasn't the case. The other point I'll mention that was interesting about this game is... The the refereeing from Walsh was quite a performance. I, I was at the time I was kind of the last two games have been like that, Alan. Well, <laughs> There've been some refereeing. <laughs> no, I, I, so I went through it. I went through it right. I'm going to look at every decision and, and I'm going to really look at it and say, was that a foul? In the first half, he awarded ten fouls against Celtic. I, I'm, I'm I'm going to be generous and say four of them, only four of them, were absolute nonsense. Mm. He, he missed he missed a trip on a jetty. Uh, I say missed a blatant trip on a jetty just before half time as he as he was coming away from goal that was wasn't given and then Turnbull was pulled back in the box which he didn't give either um you know the the the, the one of the one of the um one of the sort of scare moments for Celtic in the second half was when Mugabe actually pushed Brown with both hands out the way and got a free header and everyone's like oh another ball into the box that's not been defended mm. And then, of course, the sorrow non-red card was just an astonishing decision, actually. Um, he did get one decision, I think, in Celtic's favour wrong. I think Sorrow should have got booked when he took out um, Long, who was breaking, and Sorrow just, just cleaned him out on halfway. Mm. That was an error. But, but you know, again, um, he's a third of Celtic's foul, 16 fouls Celtic were awarded. Any contact at all uh, from for, on a Motherwell player seemed to generate a a foul. It was an astonishing performance, one of the worst I've, I've seen, actually. And that's why I went through and thought, I'm going to verify each of these and really, really try and say, is that really a foul or, you know, oh, just, just appalling. Well, we want to talk about refereeing decisions. I mean, the only reason Ajeti was playing in that game was because Celtic were, <clears throat> uh, they were uh, appealing his two-game ban from the SFA for a dive against St. Mer or against Kilmarnock which came after the game, even though you can clearly see there is contact with him. So it was, did he go down easily? He probably did. 
but he absolutely gets caught. The keeper obviously makes contact with him. Yeah, so how can it be sim- yeah. Achilles, yeah. How, how can it be simulation? And then similar to that roof with one of the worst tackles of the season gets booked and nothing is done. So consistency in refereeing in Scotland has never been the strong point of the, of the league. So apart from that aside, these two, these three games that we saw, the Kil- Kilmarnock win, the Motherwell win, and the uh, win against St. Murren, all had something in, in common. They all had a diamond, but different variations of that. We'll get to the number 10, Rajik El Unissi, whoever wants to play there. We'll get to that later on. John Joe Kenny is also something that they ha- all have in common. His first games for Celtic. Alan, first impressions on him? Yeah, I think he he, he almost looks like the uh, the Greg Taylor on the right in the sense that you know he's he does, oh, he's not God. over blessed with, with with particular pace or physicality, um, but 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 it looks like a, a good dogged solid performer defensively, um, and gives the ball away a lot. <laughs> you know, in in the two games, I don't so I don't I haven't got the data personally for the um, the game last night. I know James has got the Y Scout data, so he can perhaps uh, in, enhance this. But twenty seven passes from open plays gave, he gave away in two games, Kenny. But you know, I, I don't want to start with a negative. I, mm. I'll, I'll get more positive than that. So have to put into context very little data. Obviously, he's playing against teams that I think Kilmarnock were dreadful. Motherwell played this really passive, um, quite odd formation as well. Um, you know, he's won sixteen challenges in two games. He's had, uh, you know, that that's pretty solid. His defensive action success rate for a fullback is really good, actually, so far. But again, against poor opposition, that's but that's that's a real, that's a real uh, positive. He's almost the opposite of Tavernier, in that I've always, I've always had this weird thing with Tavernier where he looks like a really quite quick player when he's moving forward, and then he looks really slow when he's trying to recover, and. Uh, um, Kenny looks the opposite to that. He's a little bit ponderous going forward, but his recovery speed uh, going the other way and, and uh, is actually really impressive. And he's, he's made a number of tackles uh, on, the re- on the recovery, which he's going to have to do with this system where the fullbacks kind of both, uh, both bomb on. The one thing that was kind of irking me a little bit in the Motherwell game was the amount of time he had space in front of him that he didn't take. I kept saying, I kept, I kept shouting to the TV, you know, take the space, take the space. And he would, he would have space in front of him, no one really closing him down, and he would just kind of look inside. On the positive side, he's got this quite interesting thing, which actually Ball and Goalie's got, where he plays these really nice inside angle passes, which I like. So look, kind of low passes that are, that are forward, but diagonal. Um, I like that, and because they're quite interesting angles, and they're not... They're not the usual run-of-the-mill passes that people make. Taylor's a little bit um, predictable. Although what I've noticed with Taylor in the last few games is he's really he, he seems to be focusing on the the tyranny cutback. The number of low cutbacks that Taylor's now making, uh, especially with the, the four in midfield, the, the, you'd expect the midfield support to be there, it has increased, which I think is a really good sign. But back to Kenny uh, again. There's a bit of a mixed story here. He's been successful f- by my stats. In one in 16 crosses, that's not great. But on the other hand, he has created four chances. 0.43 expected assists over two games is pretty decent. Three secondary assists is pretty decent mm-hmm. as well. And his receiving impact, so that's like receiving forward passes, as we talked about, is he's scored over 100 in that in both games, which is quite astonishing, actually. But I think that more reflects the style of the opposition than it does his ability to find space but in particular. So, mm-hmm. long story short, I'm kind of enthusiastic because I think from a defensive perspective, he looks like a pretty solid customer who knows the right back role and is going to keep the shape in a defensive uh, formation. And I think uh, going forward, he's, he's offered enough. I don't think he's going to be some monster assist machine, but he's offered enough at least to t- to get the team forward. So that would yeah. be my, my initial views, really. Well, hopefully we get to see more of him and that data will become more clear as he plays more for Celtic as well. Hilariously, this is a complete side story. I started a football manager career. I just downloaded the new game and I I, I took over Celtic. I said, enough complaining, time for some action. So I took over Celtic and uh, first thing I did was take the captaincy off Scott Brown, give it to Cal McGregor. That that (laughs) went down horrendously but we still have we we still have Jeremy Frimpong and uh, Diego Laxall playing for Jeremy Frimpong still in the squad because the start of the 2021 season and uh, the first game of the season against Hamilton he had 16 he had 16 crosses and none of them were accurate at all. He had, <laughs> he had, a, he had a 2% crossing uh, accuracy at the end of the game, which I thought was 
hilariously accurate. So one out, one out of 16 from Kenny is an upgrade, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. More more to come from the football manager stuff uh, over the course of the season. Anyway, James, you're you're winning in the sidelines here. So let's get into the St. Mirren win. Obviously an upgrade on the St. Mirren loss a couple of weeks ago. A very boring 4-0 win. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it was kind of like probably my wife could attest to in our romantic life. It was about 90 seconds of fun there uh, with, with, <laughs> with, with a couple of goals late. Um, poor, poor woman been enduring me for this long, but um, so, yeah, I mean, it, for the first 55 minutes, um, I actually put summarized it in my thread this earlier today. Uh, I think it was why scout had it at about, I think 0.68 for, for St. Marin in, uh, in XG. And I think 0.29 for Celtic. Uh, so I know Lennon talked about, you know, giving them a good tongue lashing at halftime. Um, but that didn't cer- certainly didn't do anything for the first 10 minutes of the second half. And then we finally um, had a couple of chances. The big one with with Edward that was saved. That was a very high XG. It was right on the six yard line or right outside of it, I believe, um, that Alnick made a or Alnick made a, a very good save. And then that kind of unleashed things that I don't know if uh, – St. Mary and fatigued, or I, I didn't really pick anything up tactically that shifted, but uh, we, we really started to take over the game at that point. And then, you know, from the penalty forward, uh, we, we had more control. I think that the, the biggest uh, disparity between the St. Mary game and the prior two with Motherwell, uh, just to go back to the Motherwell game in particular, just to kind of highlight what, what, what Alan had said on the passivity of, of Motherwell. I, I almost thought of it as kind of a... Um, an Ali rope dope versus Foreman um, because they really, I mean, it was, I, I can't remember watching a game where a team played that passive. I mean, it was, to me, it looked obvious that they were conceding the ball to our fullbacks thinking that they weren't going to do anything with it. And so I, I'm, you know, and trying to give Alexander, is that his name? Alexander, some credit, yeah. you know, trying to think about what the game can game plan could have been. It would be, well, you know, let's let Brown and the two fullbacks who don't have a great track record of creativity, um, you know, have the ball. I mean, that picking if you're going to pick your battles, I'd rather have them on the ball than Turnbull or or Rogic or or Edward or McGregor um, and, and have them out wide. And then there has been a I would argue a, a pretty distinct trend in um, games where Brown is playing kind of post halftime where, um, you know, we've seen it kind of over and over again, where teams that kind of pick up their uh, pressing and, and push things a little bit more, uh, the, the game can turn into a bit of a uh, chaotic mess. Um, and that's, I, I documented this in my post-game thread after Motherwell that, you know, I, I actually identified 16 distinct uh, uh, periods of play where we were, you know, very vulnerable, had a better team, had the ball. You know, I, I put it analogous to like a Sparta, a Prague, you know, a team that of least functional quality on the ball. Uh, whereas, I mean, Motherwell had the ball a lot, even in the first half, the last 15 minutes of the first half, in relatively dangerous places in transition. You know, and that's been our big problem when Brown's play has been defensive transition. And they just would, you know, lose the ball or pick the wrong pass or fumble it away. Um, so there, there, in the first 15, even before the goal, there was about 15, 20 minutes, um, well, 15 minutes of that second half that had turned into a bit of chaos. And I, and, and again, if I try to be, um, charitable to Alexander, I would say, I mean, it really did come down to, they almost drew the game at the end. Uh, so, and, 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 you know, for them to come into a game with against Celtic and get that close to drawing a game again, I'm trying to be charitable. And trying to think about what what he could have been doing, and the the counter to that with Goodwin and what what, what he did with St. Marin is they definitely pressed us more, and I thought McGrath going out was a big loss for them. I mean he was playing very well, um, statistically he's one of the better midfielders this season in the SPFL um, and, and various metrics. Yeah, um, he was man of the match in Parkhead as well in the one no win. Yeah, so I, I think that, and again, a team like St. Marin, I mean, Brophy was out for some reason. I mean, they, they just don't have the depth to be losing their best player or one of their best players and then having uh, somebody to step in, particularly at that position. I mean, he was playing either support striker or, you know, kind of a number 10. 
Um, so they, they gave us a lot more problems in the midfield, I thought, because they weren't as passive. So even, even up until, again, that kind of 55 minute mark, you know, I was getting frustrated watching the game. I mean, you wouldn't think that one team has 30 times the, the wage bill than the other one. I mean, it, particularly in midfield, they were giving us all that we could handle. I mean, you couldn't really pick out which team had <laughs> the, the supposedly superior midfield, let alone four of them in there. Um, so, you know, I, and again, if we talk about this from an XG perspective, I think this is where the, the framing of the last three games reminds me of September. Uh, um, so we, we've had good results. We've had a 2-0, uh, what was it, 3-0, well, 2-1, and a 4-0. Uh, but if you look at the actual underlying XG differential over three games, it has not been that uh, strong. In fact, I would argue, um, you know, below average in, in all three of the games. Um, so I, I would say that we're, you know, enjoying some positive variance at the moment um, from, a, you know, picking up a penalty here and there. Um, you know, we're having some good finishing yesterday was a good example of that. Uh, Rogic's goal was tremendous. Christie's and Turnbull's were both, you know, angled shots. You know, they weren't really central in any of those three. Uh, so, you know, none of them were terribly high XG kind of shots. So we, we, we've enjoyed some positive variants. Certainly, you know, it's always fun to watch good goals like we got yesterday. Uh, so it was an enjoyable watch for those, uh, 90 seconds. Um, and, and, the, and the Rogic goal. But I, I'd say overall, we're still kind of limping along here. And, and that's, you know, fine right now. I think probably the worst thing, and I put this in my good, bad, the ugly thread, was losing Welsh. Um, you know, that's a real bummer. I think if it's any kind of duration, and it certainly looked like a nasty one. Um, and again, so I was saying <laughs> to Alan about the officiating, I mean, the, the refereeing yesterday too, that you know, that was a pretty severe tackle. I thought McGregor was fortunate not to get a yellow in, the least, in his one yeah. Yeah. or, or worse potentially, um, with his tackle. <clears throat> I mean, the guy almost seemed to be, uh, <laughs> taking the day off, <laughs> not really interested in even talking to players. Um, so yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're still plotting along. I don't see much difference in kind of the post to buy period here. And, and the quality of performances that we've been putting in, um, you know, there's some excitement, I think, because people understandably are happy to have three wins in a row. Um, but that's, again, why I draw the, draw the analogy to September where, yeah, they're, they're wins, they're against relatively poor opposition, and the underlying metrics are, I would say, mediocre at, uh, at best. Are you telling me that the warm weather training in Dubai in the middle of a pandemic, did not have an effect on playing in Scotland in the middle of winter. Uh, you tell me it hasn't improved things. Uh, well, I, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one thing it did do is kill any chance at uh, <laughs> putting in a rally in the league here. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. So the, the three ones on the trot, that puts Celtic, Celtic within 18 points of Rangers with a game in hand. So that would... Assuming Celtic win that game, which I, I don't know if it's safe to assume anymore, that would put obviously 15 points within Rangers. The exact or almost exact amount of points the Celtic dropped in January up until now. So if action was taken like it should have been before Christmas, then we may not be in the situation that we are at the minute where these wins, like it's great to see, it's great to see Celtic going out and win 4 0 against St. Mirren like they should, but. I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't really get that excited when Celtic win games anymore at the minute because I know that it has no effect on the league title. Yeah, I know what you mean, uh, and it's uh, and that sounds incredibly spoiled in some yeah, respects. I, I, I know. Uh, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very aware of that. I kind of, I can't I'd be lying if I said I was jumping around the living room with each goal last uh, last night, of course, um, because like you say, it's, it's almost. In fact, it's almost like you know, if we win, what if, what if we win ten in a row? Is everything all right? I mean, it, it, you know, and there's also the thing that you know, it just raises slight bits of hope. I mean, you were already. I thought I thought you were you were going with that in terms of counting down the points. It was going to be, oh, and then if we win, if we beat them twice. Then it's <laughs> this number. And I'm thinking, don't kill yourself here. Right? No, you're God, just, no. You're going, you're going God, to kill no. yourself with with false hope here. Um, no, my you know, hope so, has so, been killed long ago. Yeah, so to me, to me, I mean, it went a long time ago. So I'm kind of reconciled to that, and I'm sort of 
made my peace with with God in that respect. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, so I, I really, I'm, but but I, I feel that I'm looking forward, but nobody else in terms of Celtic FC really are looking forward. So I think I do feel like we're still in this limbo, and these wins. Um, are interesting, you know. I'll study the game. It's, I'm I love it, loving all the stats and some nice goals last night. Christie's finish was a beauty, um, but what does it actually mean? And I yeah. do feel like almost in this purgatory a little bit in that respect. Well, I, I, I think the other part of that is, I mean, we've got um, four players playing at least meaningful minutes. They're lone players. Yeah, uh, that'll increase now probably with Welsh's injury. Um, uh, with, with, I would guess Duffy probably coming in, maybe Baton if he's not in, in Israel by then, um, as has been rumored. But then you've got, you know, for whatever reason, um, Brown seemingly back as first choice. He's probably, you know, heaven help me if not, if he is still a long term plan player, <laughs> but uh, I, I may not be able to make it much longer if that happens, but uh, analytically anyway. Um, uh, and then you look at, you know, is Christie going to be here? Is Iyer going to be here? Edward, I mean, you're you're talking about out of, you know, uh, 11 players. Bain's not the long-term answer at keeper, most likely. So, I mean, how many of these players can we have any kind of real investment in? Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, we're rooting, for, we're rooting for them. But even a guy like Kenny, I mean, he's, I agree. I mean, he's been... You know, just the fact that he's making intelligent runs and being positionally disciplined has been <laughs> enjoyable to watch. Yeah, so talk about uh, minimal standards. Um, Minimum standard, man. Yeah, yeah, and he actually whips the ball in nice. You know, he's got a nice ball he puts in, uh, even though there's usually no one there. Um, so, you know, I, I've enjoyed watching him, but it's like, you know, for what's what's the point? What's the end of him? Yeah, yeah. So even even a game like yesterday, where where Rogic, I would argue that was probably his. I don't know. It's the best game I can remember from him in a while. I, I documented that in my thread this morning. I mean, he not only was he, um, I mean, he was playing. That's the other thing that's been interesting. I think we'll segue into this then, Alan, is, um, you know, I, I think and it's a bit fluid, but I think the way they've set up with him and Turnbull in the same midfield is with Rogic as the eight, which is interesting. It, it rotates, certainly. Right, right. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been but he's fluid. Not as fixed. He's not as fixed as is Rogic tends to have been under other systems where he's very much that 10. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. And, and I would say yesterday, cause he played some eight under, uh, Rogers, even during that really good period in the fall of 18, uh, when Brown was out and we did real well. And, in, in during that stretch and even against Red Bull Leipzig and, uh, and, and Rosenberg, I believe, um, he played an eight at that point, but again, that was already three years ago. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, he's no, even already, he's not a spring chicken anymore. Yeah. And, uh, so that, that was the fastest. I, you know, again, we don't get tracking data, but that a couple of those runs he made, that was the fastest I've seen him move in quite some time. And he, he even, uh, you know, he won more duels than he lost, which is not all that common for him. I mean, he just had even a physically dominant, uh, performance yesterday, which is unusual for him. You know, he usually flatters with the skill. Um, but, you know, to, yesterday it was like watching, uh, you know, a, a 17, 18 Rogic performance. And, uh, you know, that's why he's so easy to to like, because there's that just great skill involved. And then if he's running and gunning like that. But again, is he a long term answer at this point? He probably shouldn't be given his age and, you know, the likelihood of him not being able to keep up that kind of uh, athleticism. For any length of time so again he's another one where it's almost like a you know it's, a, it's like a it's like a reunion you know you, yeah. you, you run into people and you're like hey you know and it's like you, you cherish the memories and stuff but not really much to do about the future yeah well that's one of the issues as well and it sort of ties into the the broader point of what what does it all mean or what's the end game here because someone like Tom Rogic who wanted to leave or was almost the club was willing to let go at the start of the season are they playing well because they are revitalized or that they want to do well? Or are they playing well because they want to play themselves back into form to get people noticing them again by the end of the season? And Tom Rogic is one of those players that I absolutely adore. I think he's an amazing talent, but he doesn't do it enough. So uh, that, that would be my initial thoughts on the number 10. And if we're going forward with the diamond... We played a couple of different variations of that. We played Turnbull as a 10. We played Rogic as a 10. We even played El Unissi as a 10 against uh, Kilmarnock, which 
makes absolutely no sense in my mind. But is there data, you, Alan? I know you were kind of looking back at this. What are we looking at in terms of our number 10 going forward? Who's the best option? Yeah, so I didn't fully answer that because I would have looked at Christie, but I was looking at Rogic and Turnbull, really, um, because I think Turnbull uh, actually looks comfortable as an 8 or a 10. Rogic, I think, is really... I know he has fitted in it occasionally, but really, I think he's 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 a he's an almost an old fashioned throwback, that classic number ten, you know, um, luxury a luxury. Yeah, set yeah, definitely. So I wanted to kind of compare those two. So the one thing I did do is I, I just stripped out all the set piece set piece play because I think Turnbull is and and, I, and I'm I don't know if this is true because I don't have the comparative data, but. Turnbull looks like he could be like elite level set piece <laughs> provider, you know, in terms of his, his, his ability with corners and free kicks. Um, the number of chances he's created is phenomenal. So I stripped that out because Rogic doesn't take free kicks. I've just looked at really open play. The first thing I would say is that Turnbull is simply a lot more involved than Rogic in the game. I mean, the fact that Turnbull completes around 48 passes per game and Rogic 29 just tells you that Turnbull, you know, for whatever reason, gets, gets on the ball a lot more than Rogic does. And it's probably the fact that you know, Turnbull has got a lot of time at eight where he's probably getting, he's probably coming on to the play a lot more rather than sort of back to goal, which Rogic tends to be. Um, but in terms of creativity, it's quite an interesting picture because actually if you look at expected assists, um, Rogic is actually slightly ahead. <laughs> he's, he's, believe it or not, he's got a kind of 0. 0.32 expected assists per game from open play. And uh, Turnbull's actually 0.27, which that kind of surprised me, especially as um, Turnbull actually plays more key passes, and he he um, plays about um, four times, five times actually more passes into the danger zone. So Turnbull's providing passes into that central corridor in front of goal, um, you know, out to the 18-yard box. He, he's he's providing about 2.4 of those a game, whereas with Rogic it's only uh, you know one every other game. So um, Turnbull's providing more key passes. He's providing more chances. He's providing chances in great areas. And yet Rogic is providing a higher overall um, expected assist rate from open play. Again, this is from open play. Mm. Can, I, can I ask you something real quick, Alan? Yeah, yeah. Just, just at a point of clarity. Um, so I, I'm guessing then that those stats that you're referring to do not include last night. Correct. Right. Yeah. Because right. again, so this, I, is, this is this season. This is this season's data. Right. So um, they'll have expanded that lead. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. They'll, they'll go up a bit. Definitely. Right. Uh, based on based on the data I've got, we're looking at about twelve and a half games worth of data for Rogic and about fourteen games worth of data for for Turnbull. So it's pretty pretty level in that respect. Right. So Turnbull's definitely better in terms of breaking lines. So his passing, his pack passing rate is about, um, you know. He scores at th in my index about thirty eight. Rogic is about twenty five. So it's, it's a decent a decent gap there. And also Turnbull actually is better at receiving the ball. He receives the ball from forward passes slightly more than Rogic does. Rogic is slightly more up on um, you know ball carries. I think the one thing that would stop Turnbull being probably you know almost a world class player. I think he's that good. Uh, is, is, is he just doesn't have that pace. He doesn't have a, a change of pace. Whereas Rogic has got a, a long stride. I think, as you said last night, when he is fit and he is flexible and he's he's on his he's on his game, he actually has got a little bit more pace and a and he's quite a tall guy actually. A little bit more reach probably than than it, than it might surprise people. So I would say it's it's quite an interesting picture. Then all all if I look at all of the foundational data. I would put Turnbull ahead as a more creative presence than Rogic, but when it comes down to the the killer stat of expected assists, Rogic has got the has got yeah. the edge. It's quite interesting. That receiving the ball data would that be used to measure the movement between the yeah. lines of an opposition? Because that, that that surprised me. Because for example, the game against St. Mirren, I thought Rogic was the perfect example of what he brings to the team because he the where he was receiving the ball was in between the St. Murren players, which we didn't have when we lost against them in Parkhead because so, they so, packed yeah, the yeah, edge of their you. box and he was getting in between them. So I, I, I'm surprised to hear that Turnbull's ahead so, in that. So what? So I think the, 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 this is why the packing thing is, is it's multi-dimensional. It's not just the ability, it's not just the movement. It's also the control and then the decision-making. Can you then complete your next action? So where I think, uh, Turnbull is exceptional in my mind, is the way he receives the ball and, and instant control 
um, and always with his head up and his body shape is good in terms of the you know being in position to play the, the next pass usually forward that that to me if you saw that if you were scouting someone i saw that attribute in somebody i would be watching them very closely because it's actually quite rare whereas with rogic um he can miscontrol the ball his body shape isn't always that great he's not always got good balance he's quite a big bulky guy if, if you look at stats for being dispossessed Rogic is dispossessed twice as much as Turnbull. I don't think Rogic always makes good decisions. He's, he turns into trouble sometimes. He perhaps tries to run with the ball when he shouldn't. What I observe with Turnbull is his decision making is excellent. He, he won't he won't run and he will take space, but he won't he won't usually try and beat a man if he doesn't think it's on. And like I say, his body shape and his head up, his ability to control the ball under pressure with his head up allows him that fraction of a second. To perform the next action, that will come through in that that packing stat as well. The, all those kind of attributes. If I go on to scoring, um, obviously Turnbull's probably got a few more goals than Rogic, but actually, uh, again, it might surprise you that um, if you look at again p- pure expected goals, it's two point seven per game for Rogic and it's two point six for Turnbull. Very very similar, but you might expect Rogic uh, Turnbull's to be to be higher than that, especially that Turnbull takes so many more shots. Um, you know, Turnbull's taking, um, sorry, I'm just looking. Turnbull take, well, it's not, let's not say lots more. Turnbull's taking just over three shots a game with Rogic, she's just over two. So Turnbull is taking more shots and he's taking more shots from outside the box. 68% of Rogic's, if, sorry, Turnbull's shots are outside the box, um, but only 59% of Rogic's. And again, where I think you, the reason that you see the disparity is because I think Turnbull is just a far more technically proficient shooter than Rogic is. I know that seems odd after the goal yesterday that Rogic scored. But, and the reason I say that is that um, despite the fact that Turnbull's taking shots from a far greater distance, he's converting a, qu- a quarter of his shots on target. So if he gets the ball on target, Turnbull, and you've seen that with some of his long shooting, it's in the corner. A lot of it, mm-hmm. a lot of the time, he's fi- he finds the corner. Whereas with Rogic, he's, Rogic is only converting 13% of shots that he gets on target. So although Turnbull, as I say, is taking, you'd think, um, his expected goals, his expected uh, goals per shot is almost half Rogic's. <laughs> his shot accuracy is better and his conversion rate is better because I think technically he's just a better striker of the football. Yeah. So again, it's, it's an interesting uh, mix, of, mix of impressions there. What that means overall is that in terms of scoring contributions, Turnbull's racking up a goal and assist every 104 minutes. Now, again, the assists that he's creating from set pieces is actually rolled up into that, whereas with Rogic, it's every 162 minutes. And then finally, the last thing I'll cover is just the sort of defensive side of the game. Um, they're both, they both get packed the same number of times, so they're both getting bypassed the same number, nothing much there. They both actually win the same number of challenges um, per game, and they both win. They both uh, recover the ball. The same number of times per game as well. Where where Rogic um, is, I suppose, not as effective as Turnbull, as I say, is, is the fact that he's dis- dispossessed twice as many times, and he, he's twice he's twice as uh, likely not to be successful in a challenge as Turnbull is. Uh, he, he's about ten unsuccessful challenges a game, and actually, if you look at the defensive action success rate for Rogic, it's sixteen percent, which is pretty low in what you'd expect of a forward, really. Whereas with Turnbull, it's thirty percent, which is, is actually quite decent for an attacking midfielder and again I think that comes down to body shape positioning intelligent uh, you know intelligence in that sense so you know it's it's not a black and white it never is that's why when you have that much data it's a much more nuanced debate I like uh, Rogic as you said for a lot for others because he's pleasing on the eye he's a throwback to the 70s and 80s where, you know when I was a kid in the uh, the classic number 10s but Turnbull I think has got the has got abilities which you know could make him uh, a, a near elite level player um, and, and, and whilst I think Rogic's raw expected assists and expected goals are, are higher I think with Turnbull when you also add in his set play what he gives the team in that regard which we've not really touched on as a comparator um, you know I think he would be for me the, definitely, definitely the way forward especially as Rogic at 28 ain't, ain't going to improve Yeah, James do you yeah, want to so, come in on that? Yeah so I, I uh I knew we were going to talk about this, obviously. So I tried to think about how I could add, um, uh, kind of supplement what, what what Alan was going to discuss. 
So the, the one thing from what I've looked at across um, players, so not just Celtic players, but I'll, I'll use Christie as an example. So um, and this is going off of um, modern uh, football data, modern FITBA, the, their Patreon, which is league data from, from Ortec. Um, he's averaging 0.2 uh, XA. Now they do a different XA calculation versus 0.12 per game for, for Christie. Um, so from open play, uh, no, this is just from corners. Okay. Okay. Just from corners. Yeah. So he, he, th again, on a ratio basis, I know, I know that your model's different, but if you look at it, he basically per game is offering as much XA from corners as he does from open play, actually yeah. a little more, Yeah. which, sense. which, which speaks to, um, that being an elite skill for him, which goes back to this idea of striking the ball, controlling the ball. I mean, I do. I think his ability to control the ball is, you know, an outlier uh, in, a, in a good way. And, you know, why anyone else is taking corners over this guy under any circumstances. This, this is where, again, there can be a bastardization of statistics. Right. So you, if, 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 you know, if you look at data and you say, oh, well, in swinging corners are you know, 3% more likely than out swinging corners than while we're going to have Christie do him because he's left footed from, you know, that side and, and Turnbull on the other. And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you've got an elite deliverer of the ball here. I'd rather have that person doing it um, because the, the marginal gain from that him, him doing, even though it's, you know, not the, the ideal in swing or out swing is, is, is more important. Um, and I'm theorizing that's why they're doing it. I, mean, I, I can't come up with another reason why you would have Christie on it or or McGregor or, you know, Griffiths is a little bit different story because he's been very good as, in that as well. But uh, so that was the first thing. The, the second thing is I, I agree with Alan. He, he's a bit of a tweener for me. Um, and I, that's a U.S. sports term. So he, he's he's not really a pure 10 right now. And he's not really a pure eight. He's got the, a lot of these elements that make him both good and weak in both of those positions. And I think that the positive part of this is that um, where he is weak within the context of a 10, which I think is where he probably should be longer term, is it seems to me those are development areas and that they could be coached. So again, for context, um, to supplement what Alan has said, what I did is I expanded my purview to look at other uh, you know, forwards, particularly at Rangers, to see what kind of output they have as context. You know, so they they play a lot of tens or pseudo tens with their system, right? So you can look at a Haji, you can look at a Kent, you can look at a Arfield or a Rebo. At different times, they're playing in that kind of hybrid role where they're sort of an eight, they're sort of a ten, they're so, sort of a winger. You know, they spend a lot of time in that half space, um, and that's where. Turnbull very much looks more like an eight compared to those players and Rogic. So when you look at, um, you know, uh, XA per key pass, for example, you know, it's kind of the equivalent of uh, XG per shot. You know, to me, that's a proxy for decision making in that last third of the pitch. So I agree with Alan. I think he looks like he's got elite um, ball control and decision making as a as a number eight you know, kind of playing deep, he has tremendous vision and ball control and and passing from deep. But the numbers that I've been looking at suggest that his, um, his ability to create for teammates and putting them in position where they're taking high XG shots is actually, you know, a good bit below that peer group. Um, so that's not necessarily a bad thing long term. Again, you're seeing that in his shooting as well. I agree with Alan. He is actually, it looks to me like he has an innate ability. And again, I looked at his data back in 1819 at, at Motherwell as well. He does seem to have a talent for shooting from range. But as we saw in the game yesterday, you have to be almost perfect to beat a decent keeper from 30 yards, even if you put it in the corner. I mean, it's just, that's why the XG is two or, you know, 0 0.02 or 0 0.03. So even if he's a hundred percent better than the average player, and he turns that 02 into an 04, it's still a 4% shot. It's not going to go in most of the time. So his XG per shot is actually lower than Christie's in the league. Now, this is not all the games, right? So he's taking a lot of shots from distance. 
um, and he's only scored one uh, from really outside the box, and it was a free kick. So, again, if you get him inside the box like yesterday, same thing with Christie. I mean, we had two players that have problems shooting from range that finally took shots even though they were angled. It goes to show that they do have very good shooting skills inside the 18, <laughs> uh, where both of them are putting the ball on target over 50%. Um, so that, that's, that's very good even when you're, when you're angled. So th that's another thing. Um, the last thing I'll say is, and again, end of, I don't, I'm not sure you'll get the time, but, um, I, I looked at the heat maps of, um, so I'm able to do this in Y scout. You can, you can run the heat maps by position. So I looked at all of the minutes that, um, at that, that, uh, he's played at attacking midfielder as a number 10 in the SPFL. So there's a little bit of that at Motherwell. Um, most of it's at Celtic. And then I compared that with Rogic is all of his minutes at Celtic as a number 10. And then I compared it to his time only as a central midfielder between the two teams. So again, all of the SPFL minutes. And I, it's very noticeable that even as he's played as a number 10, it's not as pure of a number 10 as Alan has said, as, as uh, Rogic has been, where he's very central. You know, he's got real heat spots, dead center on the pitch. Uh, whereas, you know, Turnbull doesn't have much presence there in his heat maps. Uh, you know, he's got a decent amount off to the left outside the 18, but he's got more deep, almost like a number eight when he's playing as a, as, as a 10. So again, some of that might be natural because he's, he played most of his minutes in his career up until this point as an eight, as an attacking eight at Motherwell. Um, so that's, again, the, long story short here, I'm incredibly positive on him. I see, I agree with almost everything that Alan has said from an assessment perspective. I think if his decision-making in that last pass, you know, kind of 30 yards in to the opposition goal and his shooting decision-making goes up, and those are not, you know, mutually exclusive, meaning that when he's taking those 30 yard shots, he's not passing the ball to teammates that might be in a better position. Um, so to me, the fact that he's got a really low uh, XG per shot and a low XA per key pass tells me that there's some cognitive development and decision making development that could take place, you know, in that number 10 position closer to goal. Another reason to get a good manager in. Yeah, and <laughs> but, I mean, but uh, yeah, but he has the ability. Sorry, and but he has the ability, the, the ability to take the ball under pressure and control it, he, whether he's got his back to the goal or not. That's such a precious commodity, and you'll see all the best players have got that. And when you play the best teams, they can they find space in tight corners and and can play, can still play, and still have their head up. Well, um, which means so, so, so as a ten, I think he he could mitigate any particular. Uh, lack of pace potentially because of all of these other attributes that he has. But I agree with James. The data is absolutely clear on exactly what, what you said. The expected assists per pass and expected goals per shot are just are just a bit too low at the moment, and that's definitely an area for improvement. Yeah, and and, and I, I would even say scary low. I mean, they're yeah. they're at levels like I said that when your xG per shot is lower than Christie's, that's <laughs> that speaks Not volumes good. to decision making. <laughs> Yeah. The, the other thing I will say is, you know, this comes back to kind of um, composition of a team. So, you know, I, I think he's such a good player that he, he shouldn't be pigeonholed as a 10. I mean, he, he could easily play as an attacking eight as long as you have a, a good six, you know, a, a young athletic six playing and probably a young athletic eight on the other side that might be geared more towards box to box, box to box, you know, more like a Christie type or you know, preferably even one a little bit more defensively um, uh, adept as, as Christie, uh, but someone that can run in with energy so that they can kind of complement each other. You know, you, you wouldn't want, you know, again, this is why we get these things with Lennon. You, you wouldn't want uh, a McGregor, Turnbull, Brown midfield three and a 4-3-3, uh, that kind of mix, because you're, you're not getting enough athleticism in transition. So you, I think he can play that role as long as he's with teammates that, you know, can, can kind of cover up for some of those weaknesses like his lack of pace. Because it's, you know, you can find uh, defensively adept midfielders that are young with pace to complement 
uh, David Turnbull, uh, the skills that he has are the kind of things that are relatively rare. Uh, so I'd rather build a team around um, complementing his strengths and support, you know, kind of fill in for the weaknesses than the other way around. Because when you get elite ball playing uh, abilities like this, I mean, it could be a game changer type of, of talent. Well, hopefully we might see a little bit more of him. And as we progress down the rest of this season, it looks like Scott Brown's going to be that number six. And uh, that's not really the athletic uh, partnership that you're going to build your team around so, David so, Turnbull for. Uh, I'd forgotten, actually, you know, I, it, it could have been worse, right? You know, Brown, Brown I know he, he did lose his place, but actually he was missed two games because he was one of the, the COVID mm. fallout people. And he missed two games because he was suspended. I'm thinking um, Lennon would have had uh, sorrow in sorrow out. I think it looked to me like Lennon's been itching for an excuse to get sorrow out of the team. That's what it's looked to me. Yeah, look, we um, we got a lot of questions in on Twitter about Scott Brown, and one of them was the, another podcast saying that Celtic win more games with Scott Brown in the team than than not in the team. We are going to dedicate a podcast to this, to the number six, to the midfield, because it's too big of a broad, uh, broad of a topic to discuss in, its, uh, in a 10-minute conversation. And we don't want to bore you at the end of a 50-minute podcast to talk about the, the ins and outs of Celtic midfield. But I, So I promise we will do that Scott Brown midfield podcast soon, because I do, and I am weary of... It coming across as a vendetta against Scott Brown because that's absolutely what, not what it was. He actually had a quite a, quite a good game, I thought, against St. Mern and against Motherwell as well. Yeah. So he, he does have qualities, but is he the future of Celtics? Probably not. And I think that is a good enough note to end this week's podcast on because I promise you we will come back with our Scott Brown special next week, if not the week after that. Juco James and Alan Morrison, absolutely brilliant stuff as always. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Thank guys. All right, we'll chat to you next week. Take care.